Well, everybody, would you grab this here? It's your sermon outline. And if you're watching at home or anywhere else in the world, uh, if you could, you could text outline to 56316 to get the digital version as well. Our series is A Better Way, and we're talking about the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, just this hour, last week, we, Isabel and I, were down in Southern California in Orange County at our new church plant. And on Monday, we were out with a couple from the church, outdoor dining. We joined a little bit of food. It was about 4.30 in the afternoon. And there was a table just next to us. And there was a couple of young ladies and they were eating some and drinking some and probably drinking some more than eating some, okay? And one of them went to the restroom and on her way back, she came over to our table to the four of us and she stopped, held the table like she owned the restaurant. And she looked at us and she went, hi, I'm a little tipsy. <laughs> and I thought, you're a lot of tipsy, not a little tipsy. And she goes, but that's what happens when you get rid of the kids for an afternoon. I said, well, that's not what I typically do, but this is interesting. And, and we said, hey, it's interesting that you mentioned kids. And she mentioned she had a 15-year-old and a five-year-old. And we said, we're actually doing a series based on Pastor Ray's series on X, how to raise G-rated kids in an X-rated world. And she goes, oh my goodness, I need to hear that series. And she started talking about how difficult it was to raise kids today and then how difficult her upbringing was as well. The conflict in her house between her mom mom and her dad, and he was a rageaholic, alcoholic, all of that stuff that was going on. It was cr kind of crazy. But in the end, we ended up outdoor dining, everyone, praying with her, holding hands and praying with her. We didn't lead her to Jesus, but we got her a bit down the road, everybody. And, and we talked to her. She was still tipsy at the end of it, but you know what? She did hear some of the good news. And actually, when, when, when we were talking to her, I thought to myself, here is a really good girl. Here's, here's a mom that's just trying to do her best in life and trying to be the best version of herself. But how many people know it's really difficult? It's really difficult, everyone. And she doesn't yet know Jesus and she doesn't know the source of new life. Here's our question today. How can I live the life I've always wanted to live? She wants to live a great life, but she hasn't discovered the source of life. This is what we are gonna be delving into today. In our key text from Galatians chapter five, there's a choice that we need to make. And answering this question, Jesus really makes it quite simple. You know, in life, if you go to someone outside of the church, they could charge you a lot of money to answer this question, but Jesus made it easy. He brought it down to options. Look at your options up here. Real simple, everyone. Jesus said there's two categories. You're either lost or found. You're in darkness or in light. You're on a broad road or you're on a narrow road. And real simple, everyone, you're either living with the power of self, which doesn't work, or you're living with the power of the Holy Spirit. What makes Christianity fundamentally different, it's not because, oh, Christians are nice people and they go to, don't go to nightclubs and they don't deal drugs. That's what Christians, no. Christians have a living relationship with the living God, everyone. And they live with a different source of strength in their life. And here's the choice. Either we're gonna live our lives on the power of self or we're gonna live our lives on the power of the Spirit. And, and look at the difference here. Verse 19 talks about, Paul talks about what it's li like to live just with the power of self. He calls it the acts of the flesh, the sinful nature is the biblical term. The acts of the flesh are obvious. And look at this list. Everyone put on your seatbelt. This is not a happy reading. Are you ready? If you live with the power of self, this is what you produce. Sexual immorality, impurity. Look at this word, debauchery. When was the last time you said that? It's quite a word. Idolatry, witchcraft. And then he moves to the online digital social media sins. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition. And then he talks about America, dissensions, factions. Does that sound like America today? And envy. And then he talks about Ireland, drunkenness, orgies. And I like what he does at the end, and the like. If you look at that up in the Greek, it means whatever. That's basically what he's doing. All the crazy stuff, where does it come from? It comes from us being rooted in self. And then he says these words, I warn you as I did before, that those who live like this will not what? Inherit the kingdom of God. They won't know the life they've always wanted to live. And then he contrasts living in self and the power of self to living in the power of the Spirit and what you produce there. Look at this. But the fruit of the Spirit 
Spirit, not your fruit, not your discipline, not your focus, but the fruit of the Spirit being connected to the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace. Does this sound like a better list, everybody? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And against such things, there is no law. In our quote there from Douglas Moo, he said this, it's not about, you know, just one or two fruits. It's about the cumulative effect of all of the fruits. When we come jump to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we hear there about the gifts of the Spirit. It's interesting, Paul says this, to one is given, to another is given. Not one person has all nine gifts, but there's nine fruits of the Spirit and we don't get to pick and choose with those. You see, I know God's will for my life, everybody. And God's will for my life is simply this, that I shop in Trader Joe's. Everyone with me? Trader Joe's, everyone. It is God's will for your life. And when I walk into Trader Joe's, they have an enormous amount of fruit. And I don't buy all the fruit that's available because I know what I want. I know I need raspberries and blueberries for my breakfast, everyone. Granola, yogurt, and that's what's on top. And then I need bananas, okay? They call me banana man in the office because 10, 15 every day, everyone, you gotta have the banana in you. I don't have all the fruit that's available in the store. But when it comes to the fruit of the Spirit, you can't pick and choose. You got to have all of it. It's not like you go, you know what? I want the joy, but no self-control. That sounds dangerous right there, everybody. You got to try and bear all. And this is really important because when you read this list, it can be overwhelming. How am I going to do it? But this is the key, everyone. It's not about you. It's about the Spirit in you. He is the one that bears the fruit through you. So how can I live the life I've always wanted to live? Well, there's three fruits that we're going to focus on. Actually, we're going to build them on last week's fruits as well. Look at this. Because of God's love, the first fruit of the Spirit, I want, I can live my life with what? With patience. Because of God's love, I can live my life with patience. So this is going to be a vulnerable sermon today because these are big subjects, everyone, that we need to talk about. Is there anyone else in this room just like me or watching online and you struggle with patience? Anyone struggle with patience? Come on, people. Oh, I struggle with patience. Again, you know what? When I go to Trader Joe's and I load up my cart and when it comes to checkout, what do you do, everyone? What do you do? You are looking for the shortest line. It's not correct. You're looking for the shortest line and you're trying to spot the lady that's going to pay with her purse with the exact change, okay? Do you know what? I don't want that person. I'm really ready to pay the bill myself at that moment in time. I want contactless. I want short. I want to run away. That's what I want to do. And America, I love you. And you know what? But can I just talk to you as a European as a moment, just as a European, Okay. Do you know what? We all need some more roundabouts. We need more roundabouts. I seem to spend half my life at traffic lights. Is anyone else with me? Okay. I wake up in the morning. I'm well shaped. By the time I get to work, I've got stubble because I've spent so much time at the traffic lights and I'm looking at them and I'm timing them. They're next. They're next. They're over here. And I might be over there. And then someone ruins it all. A pedestrian comes along. Are you with me? I'm going, no, no, don't touch the button. Don't touch the button. Jesus, electrocute them. Don't let them. And and I'm getting nervous and and I'm impatient. Is there anyone else like me? Patience. It's a really hard thing. But, but, But what is the root of impatience? Do you know what? It's actually a lack of feeling loved. When we know that we are loved, It really deals with a lot of impatience in our lives. You see, I find this, that in life, I I, I start to worry. I start to worry and it leads to this, you know, this anxiety in life. And and where does it come from? It comes from this lack of love. How many people remember when their kids were younger and and they couldn't talk? They were just like babies and, and they were crying and you're going, there is no need to cry. You're sitting in a rocker. The whole world revolves revolves around you. The fridge is full of food. I will hug you, kiss you, provide for you. I've even started a college fund for you. You don't need to cry. Why? Because you are loved. 
And sometimes it's a lack of understanding in our lives of real love that leads us to worry and anxiety and doing the wrong things and getting impatient. But also it leads to another aspect of being driven in life. When we don't know we're loved, we get driven in life. And, and you know what? That leads to the area of achievement. We want to overachieve and we start like getting driven and we go, I need to prove myself in life. And you don't need to prove anything. God just loves you. But you start getting driven because you need to achieve and you drive, you drive, you drive. And not only do you drive yourself, but you drive everyone else around you and you drive them crazy. Why? Because you're trying to prove something. Love in life, you know what it does? It helps us deal with anxiety and it helps us deal with an achievement and it slows things down and it helps us go at the pace of God. The pace of God, patience, everyone. It's learning actually to be patient with God. How many people get impatient with God? Well, let's... It's reflected, in our, it's reflected in our prayer lives. Prayer life has just become Amazon Prime. We go in with our list, add to cart, and we expect it that night. Isn't that right? And God says, no, that's, I want you to understand how I work in my time. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3 says, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends, a bayside. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. Has it ever felt like that sometimes? God, what are you doing? But look, and a thousand years are like a day. You see, God's not bound by time. God is a God of eternity. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he is what? He is patient with you. Get to understand this. Not wanting what? Anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Actually, God is taking things slow because he wants people to turn from their sins and find him. You know, some of us would love God just to wrap it all up this afternoon for us all to be in heaven tonight. God said, no, because I'm patient and I'm kind and I want people to know my love. Romans 2 verse 4 says, do you show contempt for the riches of his what? Of his kindness, his forbearance and his patience. Not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. So God is kind and he is patient. And if you're hearing these words today, guess what? God says that should lead to a response and it should lead to what? Repentance in your life. Don't just presume on the kindness and patience of God, but actually respond to it. And this is the thing that I love so much. Because of the patience of God with us, we can now be patient what? With people. I love these words. Ephesians 4 verse 2 simply says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another what? in love. Here's a reality, everybody. Some people are blessings and some people are lessons. That's the way life works. But God says, no matter what category they're in, just be gentle with them, be humble with them and what be patient with them. How can I live the life I've always wanted to live? It's simple. Because of God's love, I can live with patience, but also because of God's joy, having the joy of God in my life, I can flood my world with kindness. We're going to talk about two more fruits here. And they're, they're virtually synonymous, interchangeable, and that is kindness and goodness. But to help us with our understanding, Paul does say they're very similar, but they are different. And maybe to help us with that, I think what Paul's saying, uh, kindness is like our disposition, okay? But goodness is the deeds, Kindness is just who I am. Goodness springs from that and it's what I do. Kindness is so important. Ephesians 2, 6 to 7, I wanna give you a lot of Bible here. It says, and God raised us up with Christ you and I as a Christian, and seated us with him in the heavenly realms. That's your proper zip code, everybody, in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, what? Expressed in his, what? Kindness to us in Christ Jesus. What God has done through Jesus is he has been so kind. It is the extreme of kindness our kindness to others is a simple response of God's kindness to 
us. Can I make a confession to you? Because I've been thinking about this all week. It's one of those things that as a preacher, you got to preach this to yourself before you preach it to anybody else. And I've been looking at the lists of the, you know, of the fruits of the Spirit and I'm thinking to myself, you know what? I'm doing really well there in the area of self-control. I seem, I seem to be, you know what? Managing self-control. Why? Because I was thinking this through in my head. And here's an honest moment as well. Sometimes in my mind, I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes times in my mind, I have this inner monologue going and I'm speaking to someone or looking at someone, even like sitting at the mall and I'm not thinking kind thoughts. Has anyone ever had that before? Have you ever like been looking at someone and you're not thinking kind thoughts? But then I commend myself and I pat myself on the back because I'm thinking to myself, I'm not telling them what I'm thinking. I've got lots of self-control. I've got lots of self-control. And it's like I'm going to myself, I've got like a huge melon of self-control, but I've got like this shriveled prune of kindness in my life. And do you know what? It's not really self-control. It's called a fraud factor in my life. I'm not being kind. And I think what God wants us to do is really address these areas, not in a like beat yourself up, but here's the truth. When I have a lack of kindness in my life, it's like I'm still rooted in self. And I need to get the whole root system of my life and be grafted into Christ in a brand new way. And when I'm struggling with these, you know, unkind thoughts and not being generous in that way, I need to like get over to Jesus, get back into the Spirit, lean into Him in life. Simple question, everyone. Do we think the world's become a kinder place in the last two years? <laughs> It hasn't, it hasn't. The world has gone crazy. I don't know about you, but I don't feel prepared for this. Never felt prepared for it. Still don't know what's going on. And we were never prepared for this at seminary. There's no, you know, classes on what to do in a global pandemic. There was none of that stuff. And I came across it uh, this, this week and I thought this really helps me, okay? What seminary prepares you for? There it is, everyone. It's just simple. Life is simple. No, it's not. What ministry really is, it's juggling all the time. Look at this. What ministry has been come in 2022. It's a ball pit, everyone. And that's what it's like for, I'm sure in your own industry, in your own life, maybe your own home, that's what it's like. That's what it's like. I was listening to the Scottish preacher, Alistair Begg. He's an incredible guy. And uh, he was saying this quite interesting. He said, you know, you put all this work into a sermon, okay? Put the work into a sermon for a 30-minute sermon. That's what you're hoping for today, 30-minute sermon, because you're impatient. And... Uh, <laughs> you know, 30 minute sermon. But, but he, here's the interesting thing about 30 minutes after the 30 minute sermon, you really don't remember much of it. It's demoralizing. The only thing you've taken away from it is Trader Joe's and you're on their way after service. You know what I'm saying? And, 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 but, but listen to this, listen to this here. What people really remember, what people really remember is kindness. It's not my genius and my study and all the stuff that I put together. You know what they remember? They remember kindness. Think back to school, everyone. Think back to school, okay? You don't remember your smartest teacher. All your teachers are smart. You don't remember your smartest teacher. You know who you remember? Your kindest teacher. Is that true? We call it primary, okay? Primary four, elementary school. I was eight years old. I remember we moved house and it was only about 30 miles away. But you know, when you're eight years old, it can seem like a thousand miles because it's a brand new school. It's a brand new neighborhood. Everybody's new. I remember going to that school and I remember like that, that daunting feeling in my life of starting new and not knowing anybody and just feeling out. But I remember one person, his name was Mr. Ray. He was my primary four teacher, an incredible man. And you know what? He was smart and he was good. And all, but you know what he was? He was kind. He was really kind, everyone. He helped me make that transition so much easier because he's just a kind person. And I want to encourage you with this. In life, I believe that, you know what? Our world has gone a little bit crazy. And if anything, it's, it's not just become unkind. I think we can be real here, everybody. It's become cruel. Our world has become cruel. Is the internet a cruel place? I mean, it really has. And I think, you know, what God has sent us to do at this moment in time, church, this is your moment. 
This is your moment to be kind. Yeah, you can have your opinion. Yeah, you can have your belief, your political belief, whatever you wanna believe about. But you know what? You can do that with what? Kindness in your life. How you say it verbally, how you put it online, how you just act. This is our moment. At the beginning of the year, uh, I went down, 5th of January, I went down to preach at a church in Bakersfield. Has anyone ever been to Bakersfield? They ever been to Bakersfield? I've never actually been there before. On the I-5, I've driven past it. It's just like a mirage in the distance and it's like a scary place I'll never go into. But I was invited to preach there and I didn't know the church and I didn't know the pastor. It was a friend of mine, one of our pastors, John Harris, said, hey, they want you to go. This is amazing. You're going to love it. And with the busyness of Christmas, I'll be honest, with the busyness of Christmas, suddenly it was the 5th of January and I'm driving down to 99 and going, where am I going to? Well, I met the pastor for dinner before we went to service that night. And do you know what? As soon as I met him, I thought, here's a guy that's like Jesus. I've never heard of this guy before. Don't even know what his church is like. But just over dinner, the way he treated everyone around him. You know what I thought to myself? He is kind. If you don't believe in Santa, you need to meet Pastor Wendell Vincent, everyone. He's just like gift to the world, a gift to the world. Then we went to service that night and you know, it was 1,500 people on a Wednesday night at the beginning of January, seeking God and crying out. That was amazing. And then someone said, you should show Andrew some of the buildings. And do you know what? They had buildings like ours and had a really cool children's center, a big gymnasium for all of the teenagers. And then they showed me their autism center. I was blown away, people, blown away. So many parents today, just parenting children with autism. And then he said, you know what? We've got plans to develop this and make it twice the size because we know that our children with autism are going to become adults and their parents can't live forever. They won't have a family then. We're going to become their family and we're going to build homes for them on site and we're going to make sure that they get jobs. I was like, wow. And he said, look at that over there. And it was their retirement center. And I went and checked it out for Pastor Kurt. He's going to do great. (laughs) You tell him that, Johnny. You tell him that, okay? And, 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 And this was really cool. He said, you know, I've worked for four senior pastors in my life. And they were all type A. And they all died before their wives. And their wives were left widowed. And at one point, I was able to have those four widows in the retirement home and take care of all of them. He's going to open a new retirement home for pastors that haven't, you know, just have the money to retire the way that they want to. It's remarkable. Downtown, they've got a 200,000 square foot building, escalators in it for the poor and for the needy, for all of their supplies. Amazing. And then they just got a $30 million grant from the government Government. The government using their money for good stuff, everybody. And it's to build a 126 bedroom place on site for the homeless and those recovering from addiction. Wow. Bakersfield, everybody. We're all going to be. Oh. And you know what I thought to myself? It's like one person that just said, I want to tap into the Spirit of God and not self and I'm going to, I'm going to try and be kind in this world. I'm trying to be kind. And, and I'm going to try in the life of the church, get people to be kind as well. And you know what I got to thinking? You, you know, when I looked at that church and what our church does as well, you know, we're all living our own little lives out there and we're all trying to be fruitful and, and just, you know, not have our roots in self, but have our roots in the spirit. And we're trying to be kind in our marriages, in our singleness, in our families, in our neighborhoods and in our jobs. And we're just trying to bear the fruit of the spirit. But guess what happens, everyone? When the church comes together, when we all come together, it should be like a big old fashioned fruit market. Are you with me, everyone? And we all bring our fruit together. And that's what Mexicali is about. Yes. And that's why we do Bible translation. We bring all our fruit together and we just say to the world, we're kind. What do you need? That's what we want to do, people. How can I live the life I've always wanted to live? Well, I think the Lord helps us, everyone. And he simply says this, He says, because of my love, you can live a life with patience. And because of my joy, you can just be kind. There's so much to go around. And then finally, because of God's peace, God's peace. Do you know what? I can leave a legacy of goodness. 
just goodness in my life. The story is told of two brothers who were rich, but very wicked. And both lived a very wild life, using their wealth to cover up the dark side of their lives. They attended the same church and gave large sums to various church-related projects. And suddenly, one of the brothers died and the pastor was asked to preach his funeral. The surviving brother gave the pastor an envelope and said, here is a check that will pay for the entire amount needed for the new worship sanctuary. But I only ask for one favor. Tell the people at the funeral tomorrow that my brother was a saint. The pastor was conflicted. He wanted to check, but he didn't, want, he didn't see how he could make a statement like this. Then he had an idea. So he gave the brother his word that he would do it, deposited the check in the bank, and the next day at the funeral, he said these words. This man was an ungodly sinner, wicked to the core. But compared to his brother, he was a saint. <laughs> Simple question. Uh, when we're gone, what will our legacy be? What will our legacy be? Simple, everyone. What will our legacy be? Imagine if you could put it on your gravestone. If it had just be said about us, she was patient. She was kind. And this is important that we get this. She was full of goodness. Not she was good or he was good. You see, this is where some of us cop out. That's a different fruit of the Spirit. That's what it's called to be self-controlled. That's what it is to be good. This is different. Goodness is different. It's actual deeds where we turn around and we say, we're going to take everything that God has given us, the love, the joy, and the peace, and He's going to make us way more patient in life. And because kindness, we're rooted to the Spirit of God and this kindness is in our hearts. It's going to spill over and we're going to bring goodness to the world around us. Not just being good, but we're going to, being, we're going to bring goodness to the world. I don't know if you've ever read one of the parables of Jesus in Matthew chapter 25. And Jesus said that he made this promise to believers that followed him, that were rooted in the spirit. He said, I'm going to greet you one day in eternity. I'm going to say, well done, good and what? Faithful servant. Have you ever heard that before? Well done, good and faithful servant. Know that the promise doesn't say that he will say, well said, good and faithful servant. Well posted, good and faithful servant. Great opinion, good and faithful servant. Wonderful retweet. No, well what? Done. Like you actually went out there in your lifetime and you just didn't think it and you just didn't say it, but actually you did it. You went out and you were just a blessing. You see, some of us, we talk about devotional lives and it's going to be part of our spiritual growth card and you're going to get this next week and it's going to be amazing. And we encourage you to have a daily time with God. A daily time with God. What is that daily time with God about? Just keeping us good? Help me to be good today. No, help me to do good today. I want to connect with you, Holy Spirit, this morning so I can go out and do good. You see, John Wesley said this, do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, to, uh, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. Do good. You see, the salvation that we have, everybody, is not a salvation by works. So we're not saying today, you got to do good to become a Christian. Martin Luther said this, and I thought it was so smart. He said, God doesn't need your good works. God doesn't need your good works, but your neighbor does. See, you're not saved by good works. You're saved for good works. 
for good works. And again, I'm not here today saying, well, you better all go out there and do it because it can feel overwhelming. I got to live a life that's full of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness. I'm going to say one more time, this is not about you. You doesn't work. If Mark Clark were here, he'd tell you, you're a disaster. (laughs) It's not about you. It's about him. It's about not self, but the spirit. And in all of these areas, all of us struggle, but with him, it's one of those things rooted in God, we start to bear this fruit and it just starts to come off as naturally in life. Do you know what? We're bearing the fruit of the spirit. And if you're here today and you're going, Pastor Andrew, I've tried to be that person I've tried to live my life as good as I can be. But let's be honest. On the outside, you're sitting good here today and you're looking all right. But inside, you're crying out like the girl at OC. I want to be that mom. I want to be that dad. I want to be that employee. I want to be that employee. I want to be that citizen. I want to be the person, that neighbor. But it's not working. Look at me. It's okay. There's good news today. There's a guy in the New Testament, his name is John the Baptist. And he said this, when he looked at Jesus, he said, I must decrease and he must what? Increase. John the Baptist was a pretty good guy and that was okay for him. But you know what? We can't say that. We need to go one step further and we need to say, I must decease and he must increase. I got to die. I got to say goodbye to self and relying on self And I want to open up a brand new world to the Spirit of God. I'm going to give you that opportunity right now. Whether you're watching at home, whether you're in this room or video cafe, I want you to stay where you are for a moment. But would you close your eyes? Would you bow your head? I'm going to give you a chance right now to start this relationship with Jesus to live a life with the strength of His Holy Spirit. And if that's you and you're saying, Pastor Andrew, I'm tired of self I don't want to move to the strength of the Spirit. Would you simply just pray these words with me? I'll say the words, you just repeat them into yourself. It's real simple. It's just a genuine, authentic prayer to God. Here we go. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you that you have a plan for my life. Thank you that you made me and that you know me. And Jesus, today, I give up. And Jesus, I put my trust in you. Lord, I say goodbye to self and I say hello to your spirit. Jesus, would you take my sins and just give me your forgiveness. And Jesus, my past, take it, give me your future and give me your strength so that I can live for you and bear, Lord, this beautiful fruit. Again, with your eyes closed and your head bowed, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you prayed that prayer. And when you do that, it's just me and you. Are you ready, everybody? If you prayed that prayer and you really meant it, would you put your hand up right now so I can see it? Put your hand right up so I can see it. That is fantastic. That is fantastic. Put your hand right. Let me pray for you right now. Lord, for all the people that raised their hands. Lord, so many of them, I want to thank you, Lord, for them today. They are amazing. And I just pray, Lord, that this new step that they've taken in life, Lord, that they would know this is, Lord, the first day of a brand new life, Lord. Lord, this will be the life they've always wanted to live. Come on, can we put our hands together and encourage these people that raised their hand today? It's pretty amazing, amen? Amen. 